series. But let me tell you what's coming next as well before we get into the Word of God. And that's a, a series called Margin, okay? Margin. You'll see the graphic right there. There's cards out on the table. Leave that up for just a second if you would. Making room. Can you read that? Making room for what really matters. And I can't think of a more appropriate time to be talking about this because in our culture, you know it, you see it, you've got friends who we're all just maxed out, aren't we? And it seems like as we hit into Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year, it just ramps up to an absurd, absurd pace. And we don't want to do that year after year after year. We weren't designed to live like that. So I can't think of a more timely series of messages than this right here. We're going to be talking about all kinds of different areas of our life where we need margin, where we need not to live out clear to the edges. We need space in our life for God to work and teach us things that are important about, about not just here and now, but eternity, okay? So this is going to be incredible. The cards are out there. They're banded. You can grab a few and, and be inviters, okay? This is a series you will want to invite a friend to. Even if, if someone who's just checking Jesus out doesn't really believe, all the better, okay? This will be a very, very practical series of messages. But I'm excited to get into um, Psalm 34 once again. And as we finish this up, we're going to look at the remaining set of verses in this really, really powerful testimony of David that we've been in all month long. Before we get into the scriptures, though, I want to tell you a story. It's a true story. It's a powerful story about a family you know very well because they're among us. They're, they're here so faithfully serving and giving of themselves. And, and, and I'm just telling you, this is a kind of family that just, along with many others, I know, this is the kind of family, again, that just... Um, is helping so greatly our mission to become a reality because they're just, they're just at it. They're just following the Lord so obediently and sacrificially. Scott and Valerie Rock, you, you know this family. Back in 2008, they were attending here at the time, and in 2008, they were expecting their second child. They had already welcomed him to the world, a little boy, Carter, you know him, and uh, they were expecting and excited to welcome a baby girl. Her due date was December 27th, so that's pretty exciting, right? Just around the Christmas time, we've got a December 23rd baby, so we kind of know how that feels to have that baby, but December 27th was the due date, and, um, and yet, ever since she found out they were expecting, ever since they were uh, pregnant, they, Valerie said, I could not get the date of December 13th out of my mind. I mean, it was just like constant, just December 13th, this kept coming to my mind again, that that would be the due date. I didn't know why, I didn't understand it, but it was so persistent and so, you know, powerful that I just, I just felt like maybe it was from the Lord. And he was putting that on my heart. Well, one day, Valerie woke up one morning and not feeling well at all. And really, as, as only a mother probably could know, just felt like something wasn't quite right. And she woke up on this morning and she said, well, maybe it was early contractions, early signs of labor, but still just not feeling like everything was lining up and not feeling well at all. And can you guess what morning this was? December 13th, that's right. She woke up on December 13th and had such a strong feeling. She was 38 weeks pregnant. And, and finally, after feeling this way most of the day, finally about 7 o'clock that night, she called the hospital and explained all this to the nurse who answered. And, and most noticeably, Valerie said, and, and most concerning, was the baby had not moved all day long. And so she called and thought about coming in and should we monitor, should we look at this, and then decided to wait a little bit longer and she said it was very strange in just a short period of time that nurse called back. The nurse said with some urgency, I, I don't usually do this and I, you know, I usually don't do this, but, but are you coming in? Are you sure you're not coming in? And just kind of prodded a little bit and Valerie said, yeah, we're, we're going to come in. And they got in there, the doctor monitored, hooked them all up and monitored mom and little baby girl that was growing now in her, in her womb. And, and before too long, they found out that the baby's heart rate, little Claire, was dangerously low. In fact, so low, it just caused quite an emergency in the, um, in the doctor's office there. They, they scheduled immediately an emergency C-section, and, and they delivered the baby. And as they delivered this little girl, this little precious girl, she was, Valerie said she was white as a sheet, just completely pale and motionless and lifeless. And, and Scott and her were there. And, and just, can you imagine the tension in the room? And they're trying just fervently to resuscitate this baby and nothing, no cries. And you're thinking, well, we get some suction going on there and that'll, and then the cry, but nothing happened. And, and several minutes, it felt like went by. I'm sure it seemed a lot longer. And they're praying, you know, their guts out, I'm sure. And they said they noticed the doctors kept looking back at the clock the whole time. They're frantically working, trying to figure out what was the problem, what was going on. And they just both felt this heaviness in their heart that at any moment the doctor was going to call time of, time of death. It was that severe. It was that dark. It was that desperate. And 
Doctors said they had not seen anything like it. They were frantically searching their resources, trying to figure out an answer to this life-threatening problem. And they finally did a blood test on the baby and found out that her hemoglobin, I, I'm not a medical person, I don't understand these terms, but normal levels of, this, of the blood was 14, 14 for a healthy baby. And Claire's was 3.4. Very, very desperate. In fact, so low that the doctors thought she would no doubt for certain have severe brain damage and that she would be probably on a feeding tube the rest of her life and all kinds of issues and, and consequences as a result of this. And it was just as dark as you can imagine, but it went from dark to darker when later that night the baby started having seizures and they got rushed to Stormont Vale in Topeka. For, for 17 days they were there and Valerie couldn't go right away, so she was here and baby and Scott were there and finally Valerie came and there was other complications was Valerie started having what the diagnosis was was actually officially a fetal maternal hemorrhage. It was a, it was a blood vessel that ruptured in the umbilical cord there of the baby and it leaked blood out into mom systems and which really is not good, especially if those blood types do not mesh and they didn't and Valerie had to have 15 or so doses of this certain medicine to counteract all that, and she had seizures as well, and it was just a really, really tense and desperate time, but now you'll be glad to know, of course, you, some of you do know this, they are doing amazing, and Claire will turn 11, amen? She'll turn 11 this December, December 27th. She actually was born on December 14th, right? Actually, December 14th, the due date was December 27th. She'll turn 11 December 14th, but they went in on December 13th. And I know the family has just thought of this many, many times throughout the, Claire's life. And many of you recall and you know because you walked with him through this very, very tense and very, very just challenging time of trial and trouble. But you know how the Lord delivered them, amen? How the Lord delivered them from that place. And I tell you all that, I tell you that story just to get this point of cross. I want to talk to you this morning about what it means to be delivered. To be delivered. I mean, when things look so dark and desperate, when, when you're looking at your circumstances, you're looking at your situation, and you're thinking, man, this can't ever turn right side up again. This thing that I'm walking through right now is never getting better. You know those times? Well, if you're in that place now, or if you are close to someone, you love someone dearly who's in that place, I want to remind you in the strongest way possible this morning that our God specializes in times like that. Amen? Without a doubt, no matter how it appears, I, I'm so glad to tell you this morning that our God, our great God is not limited by our circumstances. He's not chained down to how the appearance of things that, that we often get so consumed with and obsessed with. And I'm so glad for that. It's such good news. So I want to talk to you about God's deliverance this morning. And when we talk about deliverance, we, what we mean is those very real seasons in our lives, those very real circumstances in our lives that we all tend to walk through sooner or later where we experience God's very powerful, faithful intervention and help. Where we experience God's hand doing something that we could not do for ourselves, that intervening in those impossible-looking situations. And there's no doubt you're going to be able to see this theme of deliverance in this final set of verses in Psalm 34. And, and this, this series has been so powerful to my heart, and I, I pray it's been powerful to yours, and this, this will be no exception, I'm, I'm confident, as the Lord helps us. So Psalm 34, verse 17 through 22. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to be able to see the, the point of the message this morning. Okay, here it is. Psalm 34, verse 17. Words will be on the screen. Pull up the Bible on any device you have invite you to follow along. It's always a good, a good practice to get into, read the Word of God for yourself. Here we go. Psalm 34, 17. The righteous cry out. Righteous just means people who are in right relationship with God. We talk about that a lot, how that's possible for anyone to be made right in relationship with God through what Jesus did for us on the cross, the shedding of His blood, the sacrifice of Himself for our sins so that we wouldn't have to pay the penalty of those sins, but we could turn to God in faith and we could Repent of all of our sins and embrace Jesus as our only source of hope and forgiveness for life to come. That's, that's how you are made. It's a miracle, really, but it's possible for you if it's not already. The righteous cry out. The Lord hears, and he delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. 
Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. Amen? The Lord will rescue his servants. We're going to talk about that. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. And so this this word deliverance, it comes up again and again and again. It's a very, very common theme in the scriptures, and it's used a lot in the Old Testament as well. In fact, there's 11 different Hebrew words for this word that we would call deliver or deliverance. We, We don't have usually that many words to describe it, but Hebrew language is very, Hebrew language is what the Old Testament was originally written in. And, and you don't have to be a Hebrew scholar to understand the Bible, okay? You don't have to know Greek and Hebrew. Lots of great tools. You can read it on your own. But sometimes it gives us a little fuller picture of, of, of things that God wants to communicate to us. And so this, this word, 11 different times, 11 different ways, it comes up. I mean, I'm just telling you, God is so passionate about revealing himself to us in this way. Some 2,425 times in the Old Testament... And yes, I counted every one of them myself, just very meticulous. No, I'm just joking, just joking. 2,425 times in some way, shape, or form, this idea of deliverance comes up. Some of the synonyms are to release, to snatch away, to be redeemed, to be spared, to be defended. Over and over and over again, God is communicating, and he wants to communicate to us this morning, deliverance, deliverance. Deliverance, when you're at your deepest and darkest time, perhaps, of your life, or just at a season where you feel lost in general. So no doubt about it, here's the point. God rescues his people. He absolutely does. And so the title of the message this morning as we wrap up this series, One Great God, the, the, the message is Our Great Rescuer. Our Great Rescuer. And so, so, so maybe you're in a situation this morning, or again, maybe you know somebody, you're watching online right now, and you're watching on your phone or at home, and, and you're, you're thinking, man, I'm in a situation right now, and I can't take this anymore. And man, if I don't know what I'm going to do. If God don't step in, and if God doesn't do something and do something quick, I mean, I, I think I'm losing it over here. If God doesn't do something, I don't know what we're going to do, and, and I don't think this is going to end well. I kind of feel lost over here. And what I'm needing right now is I'm needing God to break in and I'm needing God to intervene and deliver me from the things that I'm facing or from the things that are coming against me. Well, listen, if that's you, listen, if that's you, you're in a good place. Now, listen, I I know, I know it doesn't feel good. And I'm not trying to be cold and you've been worshiping us for a time. You know my heart, okay? You've been hearing these, but listen, I'm not trying to be cold or callous. I'm not saying in any way I'm glad you're suffering. I'm glad you're hurting. It's not that at all. But the reason I say you're in a great place is because many, many people in the Bible have found themselves in this place. And the reason you're in a good place is because you are perfectly positioned to witness God do something, listen, incredible on your behalf. Absolutely incredible. That would powerfully and forever change the way you view him and the way you experience him in your relationship with him. And, and it, it positions you to receive something from God, for God to do something at the darkest time in your life that probably wouldn't happen in any other way if you were in a good place. So I just want you to know this morning, listen, if you're in need of God's deliverance, if you're crying out for God's deliverance today, I want you to know, first of all, God loves you. And I'm telling you, that is, that is not some Christian religious cliche that pastors say when they're preaching a sermon, okay? I'm telling you, that's fact. That's biblical fact. God loves you. He sees you there in that place. He knows all about it. And and I'm telling you, he is, listen, your circumstances can never alter God's commitment to help you, ever. And even more than that, if if your circumstances are leading you to a place of desperation, What that's doing, let me tell you what that's doing. That's leading you to a place of greater dependency on God and God alone. You're you're being led to a place, if you'll respond, if you'll respond in faith, you're being led to a place of radical dependency on God and God alone. And I'm telling you, some of you know this from personal experience, but when you get to that place of living in radical dependence upon God and God alone, wow, man, wow. 
I'm telling you, it's the greatest adventure. It's the most life-impacting thing you could ever experience. It's certainly the most God-honoring thing you could ever do to live in that way. And I'm just telling you this morning, and I'm reminding some of you, there, there's something powerful that God does in you and through you and for you in the dark times that does not happen when everything in your life is all bright and sunny. I, I know we wished it was the other way around, but it's just not. And there, there's something that takes place in the valley of life that does not take place on the mountaintop of life. And there's something that happens in your heart and in your life that shapes you and transforms you in such a powerful way when your heart is crushed and broken that does not happen when you're celebrating and blessed. It just doesn't. It, and how often we forget this. It's so simple. We often forget how important it is. But listen, in, in those times when we're crushed and we're broken and we're hurting, we learn one of the most valuable lessons we could ever learn, and it's simply this, that God and God alone is my source of help and hope. And you, you may say, well, I know that, Pastor Mark. I don't need to go through the valley. I don't need to go through this storm to figure that out. I know that, but, but do we? I mean, sometimes by the way we live, we, we, we communicate we don't. And I'm, I'm talking to myself here. Sometimes I forget that as a pastor. You know, sometimes there's this... Deadly self-sufficiency that can creep in if we're not careful. And we, we desperately, at least I know I do, all for honesty in church, anybody else need to be reminded of this? You need to be reminded sometimes, right? That God and God alone is your source of help and hope. And so let's, let's learn that lesson together this morning. Let's dive a little deeper into Psalm 34. Let's just walk back through this. And I, I'm praying this will be much more than just a churchy, religious thing for you. I, I pray that you will... Begin to recognize and you'll begin to experience this week, you, this week and, and whatever you face in the weeks to come, you'll begin to experience God's awesome deliverance and rescue. You'll be looking for it. You'll be expecting it by faith and waiting in faith for it. And even more than that, just beyond something to benefit you, we, we, you got to know, man, if you're, if you're coming on board here, if you say, this is where I feel like God wants me to grow and I feel like God wants me to serve, you need to know we are an outward focused church. This is never just about us feeling happy and blessed and comforted and going on and keeping it to ourselves the rest of the six days. Down with that, amen? And how about we go out of here and you all know somebody, right, who's hurting and crushed and brokenhearted and crying out to God and they don't understand why. We all know people like that. So how about this week, you just determine even right now, I'm going to take what I hear here. I'm going to take what I receive from the Lord here and I'm going to share it with others. And let me also say... <laughs> You don't ever have to give me the credit for that. You don't ever have to say, well, our pastor said. And show him the sermon. I mean, you can do that. But you can, just, you can just summarize it, amen. You can paraphrase it. You can share it from your own heart. And you can minister to them, amen. You can minister to your friend, your neighbor, your, your co-worker. You can, you can and invite them to come back and experience the Lord for themselves, amen. Give God the glory for it as you're doing that. So I want to show you right from this passage a very clear picture the Lord gives us of his deliverance and how his rescue becomes a reality for us in our daily lives. Because again, maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're like, man, this all sounds great. I mean, it sounds great in theory, but, but will God deliver me? I mean, what will God's deliverance look like for me in this specific season of my life? What form will it take? How will I know even he's working and how will I recognize that he's helping me get free of these difficult things? Well, I want to help you understand this a little better. Actually, I just want to point you to God's Word, and you're going to see it. God, does a, God doesn't really need any help, right? His Word's so powerful. You can just see this for yourself, but I'm going, to, I'm going to point it out to you. So look at verse 18, all right? I love this. I love how it begins. The Lord is close, or maybe your translation says near, to the brokenhearted. And here's the first way that God delivers us this morning. You're going, to, you're going to love this, okay? God's deliverance begins with His presence. Did you notice that? The Lord... The Lord himself is close to the brokenhearted. God's deliverance begins with God drawing near to us and, and us, by the Spirit's help that lives in us, being aware of his nearness in those times where we're brokenhearted, right? When we're crushed by our circumstances. We don't throw big words out a lot here, Hebrew and Greek and stuff, but, but sometimes, again, it's helpful. It's helpful just to get a better, clear picture of what God's trying to communicate to us. So the Hebrew word, you need to know this, the Hebrew word for brokenhearted here is, is the word shabar. Shabar. And it's important because that, that I mean, you could say brokenhearted, but 
it, we, sometimes we fail to grasp how, how deep this cuts. And, and the word in Hebrew is, is, is very vivid. It's like literally broken into many pieces. I mean, we're talking shattered, crushed into fine dust. I mean, we're just, just crushed and shattered. And we, we all know what it's like, right, to drop a plate in the kitchen or a glass, and it's amazing how the glass just spreads and under the counter and the, the table, and you're like, where did all this, how did this happen? I mean, it's just everywhere, and, and we all know what it's like to drop our cell phones, right, tragically, on that one pebble in the entire parking lot that just shatters the screen, and somehow it lands right there, it's shattered, right? Break a car window lately, had one broken out. And I've done some stupid stuff. I've, I've broken windows out of my own car and just stupid. And, you know, you find glass for, like, months, it feels like, right? It's like, where? We cleaned it up. I mean, like, a lot of times. And it's still, you're still finding it's just shattered. Like, well, listen, we all know what that is like. But some of you in the past or even today, you, you know in a much deeper, much more serious way what it's like to have your heart broken, Right? I mean, fractured into many pieces, as in, I can't even begin to find all the pieces here. As I'm looking at the way things are for me right now, I can't even begin to imagine how all these pieces will be put back together again. I can't even fathom how God could ever bring any good out of this at all. I've heard, I've heard a lot of stories since we've been here as your pastor. We've got gold star families here. We've got single parents who never dreamed in a million years they would ever be single parents. They never dreamed they would ever be raising their kids on their own. Husbands who have lost lives, wives who have lost husbands, people who experienced unbelievable, unexpected tragedies, but probably one of the most vivid ones, certainly the more recent ones for sure, happened last Sunday night. Last Sunday night, I was, I was expecting to be here with you all. I was very much looking forward to our Fan the Flame prayer gathering. Keep your eyes open for the next one. We have these regularly throughout the year, and, and man, they're powerful, powerful times. You need to come, and we need to be, it's, it's, it's what, it's where our success comes from, amen? It's where our help comes from, the Lord. We're nothing without Him, but I was expecting you to be here for that. Our the rest of our pastoral team did an amazing job leading that, being a part of that with you, but I... My phone in the afternoon began to buzz and blow up with messages about a family that's connected to our church who experienced a tragedy. It was a soldier. His family, actually the second time they were stationed here at Fort Riley, and they're connected to our church, the, the children especially. We've, our children's department has done an amazing job ministering to this family and the children. And we've got people connected to them. We've got people that live across the street from them here teachers that teach their kids, so we're, we're connected. And I got the call that Brian, the, the father, the husband, had been in a terrible accident. He was walking on 6th Street, and you probably saw the news. He was hit by a car and rushed to Stormont Vale in Topeka. And the messages that I began receiving began to paint quite a dark picture, and they said, he, Brian's in life-threatening condition, and he's on the ventilator. He's not, not expected to survive. And of course, I'm praying. My gut's out on the way there. You know, you're just stepping into these intense situations, and you're not, you, 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 apart from the Lord, you, there's nothing I could do or say in that moment apart from the Lord. And get there, and of course, the whole family is gathered. Many, most of the family's there. A lot of them had driven in from Omaha. As you can expect, they were just shock, an atmosphere of shock, and they were just consumed by their grief. Just kind of imagine, how does this happen? And, and Brian's laying there, and, and his wife of 12 years, Katie, is there, and Step in, you try to say something, you try to provide some comfort, but by far the most gripping image, that I'm sure the, the scene that I will never forget is the look on these kids' faces, 10 and 12 years old, the sound of their voices as they both laid across on opposite sides, but laid across their dad's chest and all this mess coming out of his, to try to keep him... And just laying there and sobbing and, and saying, Daddy, you have to wake up. We need you. You can't leave. Daddy. Man, broken hearted. You know what I'm saying? 
broken heart is absolutely shattered. And it's in those times, some of you have been through times like that where we're tempted, aren't we? This is how it works. We're tempted to feel that God is very, very far away. But you know, if you've been through those times as well, we absolutely, in those dark moments, we cannot trust our feelings. We can't trust our feelings. What, how, what can be trusted, however, is the eternal, unchanging Word of God. And, 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 and God's eternal character. And right here, right here in Psalm 34, God tells us so clearly, he is not far away. He's not far off. What, what is he? Tell me. He's close. That's right. He's close when we're broken heart. He's so near to us. And, and no, no, obviously God does not shield us from every situation that would cause our hearts to be broken. But, he, but he's near. And I can tell you, from personal experience, I can tell you with walking with dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of families that when that happens, when we walk into those seasons, I'm telling you, God rushes in. And God is close. And I'm telling you, he gets there in a hurry. He gets close to his people in a hurry. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. So if you're brokenhearted this morning, what else do you need to know? Right? What really more do we need to know than that right now? We could kind of just wrap it up this morning right there. John Wesley, who lived in another generation hey, many hundreds of years ago, he, God used him so powerfully to spark revival in different places. And John Wesley, when he was on his deathbed and experiencing his last few final moments of life with his family all gathered around holding hands, he, he said this, I love this, best of all, best of all, God is with us. I mean, best of all, what, what could be better, right? What could be better than the nearness of God and the closeness of God and the compassion of God when his children are deeply hurting? And it's not just here in Psalm 34. My goodness, it's all through God's word. God really wants us to know this. In Deuteronomy 31.8, we're reminded that God will never leave us or forsake us. If you read the rest of that verse, you write it down, you can read it later. Psalm 30, or Deuteronomy 31.8, it, it says... That he's never leave us or forsake us, therefore we should not be afraid. We should not be discouraged. Jesus himself reminds us in Matthew 28, 20, Surely, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so we have a choice to make, right? We hear that. We experience this. I, I can make a choice. I can stand there in my pain. I can stand there in the midst of my shattered pieces that are lying on the floor. And I can say, no, that's not how it is. That's not true. That's not right. Because that's not what I see and that's not what I feel. Or I can choose in those moments to trust him and take him at his word. So here's what I've determined in my life. This is how I live my life. I've just chosen when my feelings are going crazy because of the storm that I'm in, I've chosen not to make my feelings the authority in that moment. Instead, make the word of God the authority for me. And you'll never be misled if you do that. So it's a step of faith, isn't it? This morning, if you're in that tough place of darkness and desperation, you're crying out to God, you, you choose by faith to say, God, I can't see it and God, I can't feel it, but Lord, I choose to believe that you're good and that you're right here with me. And you're doing something, even if I can't understand it, even if I never see it, God, I choose to believe by faith that you're doing something powerful in the midst of this. So, so that's good, right? That's comforting. And you, you may be thinking... All right, good message. I mean, there's a, there's a degree of comfort that comes with his closeness, but maybe, maybe you're thinking right now, just close? Just near to me in my trouble? Is that, is that all I get, God? Just, just close at hand? Just with me in my fear and anxiety and disappointment and when I'm crushed? I, I need God to do something, amen? Amen. I mean, close is great. Thank God for that. But I need God to actually do something. I need God to step in. And, and, and well, listen, look at the rest of verse 18. I promise you, if you're in that place or if you've been there, God is not standing nearby just twiddling his thumbs doing nothing. I promise you that he's close. But, but look at the rest of this verse. Look at verse 18. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Saves those who are crushed in fear. L listen to this. Get this right now. Write this down. First God's presence and then his power. That's how his deliverance works. First his presence. He's close to the broken heart. He's close to you. But then he saves those. You experience his power. And I'm telling you, church, it's so important that we get the sequence right. 
You have to get the sequence right because if you think of God or if you expect God to swing in on a rope and save you out of all your troubles and then just exit, neatly exit your life again, I'm just telling you that's not how God works. It's not how he operates. It's certainly not the kind of relationship that his son and our Savior died and rose again to provide for us so we could experience that. You might think of it like this. First, the relationship, and then the rescue. And the rescue is not experienced apart from the relationship. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Well, I, I just kind of prefer that God would keep me from all the brokenness and the mess and the crushing and the heartache to begin with. How about that, God? Well, yeah, that's, that's our way, isn't it? Thanks be to God that his ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Because, in, listen, in our short-sightedness, and let's just be brutally honest this morning, sometimes our outright blindness, and I'm talking to myself, I'm putting myself, my outright blindness to things of eternal matters, listen, we, we, what we would do is we would try to spare each other of all pain and all heartache and all anything negative. But, but listen to me, God, who is perfect, Perfect in love and power and wisdom. I mean, sometimes we, listen, I'm not, I'm just saying in general, I don't have anybody in mind here, but sometimes we walk around and we think we know so much. And we talk about our difficult circumstances and we talk about what God would, should do and we, we, we think sometimes we got it all figured out, but I'm telling you, when it comes to the reality of eternity, we can only see about an inch in front of our face. Do you understand that? But what we serve a God, I mean, who is great. And, and God sees the whole picture, doesn't he? I mean, like perfectly, with perfect clarity. He truly sees the end from the beginning. And because of that, listen, God, sometimes I don't claim to understand it all. I'm just the messenger, okay? I'm just telling you what I see. Is the best understanding I have of God's word is that sometimes God in his perfect love and wisdom and care for you, sometimes he will allow things to come into your life. He'll allow you to experience things that bring you to your knees so that when he does come through, amen? Notice I didn't say if he comes through. When he comes through, when he does save, when he does rescue, when he does deliver you, when you finally see it, so he allows those hard things to come. So none of us at the end of that will be standing on the other side and saying, wow, look what I did. Woo, I was a tough, I, I must be some kind of spectacular Christian because that was a mess. But look what, no, no, listen, nobody will be saying that. And again, he allows those things to come into our lives to remind us that he and he alone is our source of help and source of hope. And so my, my encouragement to you this morning is that instead of fighting against God in those times, instead of complaining that God doesn't rescue you and deliver you the way you think ought to happen, listen, we ought to be praising God, praising God for the way he does it, not just what he does, but how he does it, because, and listen, in his wisdom, and his, he's saving us, amen, saving us from this deadly pride that can creep in so easily. That's a recipe for disaster, I'm telling you, spiritually speaking. So whatever you're going through right now, listen, whatever is causing you to be broken and crushed, listen, I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that the Lord is closer than you can imagine right now. And he is near to you and he has the power to save you from that, amen? Amen, praise God. It's absolutely the truth. Let me tell you how amazing God is, though. He doesn't just describe his deliverance to us. He doesn't just, doesn't just state as a matter of fact. Listen, he goes on these next few verses to actually show us what his rescue looks like in our lives, okay? Even in your life this week. So verses 19 through 20. This is kind of the, the confusing part of the passage because you'll notice it. Let me, let me read it. The righteous person, or actually more accurately, the righteous one, you'll see why in a minute, the righteous one may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. It's really interesting, isn't it? The shift. I mean, the pronouns are all different than what they have, but the, the righteous one, the Lord delivers him. God protects all his bones. That's different because up until now, it's all been plural. 
It says, uh, you know, his ears, this language before was his ears are attentive to their cry. The Lord hears them and he delivers them out of all their troubles. But now it's shifted. Now things are different. Now, the, now it's talking about a specific person. The question we got to answer is, who's he talking about? This is incredible. You're gonna, you're gonna, your mind's going to be blown. Listen, this part of Psalm 34 is a prophetic pointing to Jesus Christ himself. In fact, if you want to, just write Jesus down. If you've got your Bible, write down Jesus down next to verses 19 and 20 because here's what David's doing. David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, I don't even think David was probably fully aware of what he was saying here. But under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, David, who is writing a thousand years or so before Jesus Christ is even born, he uses the events of Jesus' life that's going to be recorded later to illustrate God's deliverance in our lives. It's like God saying to us, you want to know how I deliver you? You want to get a picture of what that looks like? You want want to know what I'm able to accomplish in your life? Well, just look at what I did for my son. Consider Jesus. Look, how, look at what I did in that situation. This is so powerful, I'm telling you. So in verse 19, the righteous one may have many troubles. Some translations say many are the afflictions of the righteous. And time and time and time again in the Gospels, Jesus went out of his way to communicate to his disciples that, that the Son of Man would, quote, suffer many things. Matthew 16, and in Mark 8, and Luke 9, and Luke 17, and on and on and on. He would suffer many things. Many. I mean, so, so here's the hope. Whatever you're experiencing right now, whatever you're walking through, whatever's crushing your spirit, just know this. Jesus has been through it. He's been through it. I, it's so encouraging to me. Why, why would Jesus subject himself to this? Why would he allow himself to suffer? I mean, he's the second member of the Trinity. He's the Son of God. He could have called down the angels and got himself out of that mess in a hurry. He didn't have to experience all that. Why did he allow himself to suffer many, many things? Well, I think one of the reasons, as it says in Hebrews 4.15, that Christ has experienced all the same testing and all the same trials as we have, yet he was without sin, of course. The reason for that is, is so not one of us in our dark times, in our desperate moments, could ever stand up and say, well, he just doesn't understand what I'm going through. I mean, he just doesn't have a clue how hard it is for me right now. Really? <laughs> really? God doesn't understand? He, he doesn't know. I, again, I promise you, whatever you're facing that's crushing you right now, Jesus has been through it, and then some. And then some. And not only does he know what you're going through, not only does he see you perfectly, but he has the power to help you too. He knows best how to help you. I mean, what? who better to help you than somebody who's been through it, amen? So you know how this works in your, in your human, earthly relationships, right? I mean, when you're going through a tough time, when you're experiencing great difficulty and challenge in your life, who do you turn to? Tell me. You turn to those people who've been through something like that, right? And what a great joy it is to have relationships around you that you can identify with people on that level. And, and they're not just standing there nodding their head and, and intellectually knowing. No, they know experientially. They've been through it. And so there's this, there's this wonderful, powerful affinity that you have with people who, I mean, just on a normal, everyday level, like if people like the same music as you like or have the same hobbies or have the same MOS or they, they work at the same place or they... There's this affinity, there's this identification that happens. It's so, so comforting, right? So encouraging. Now, some of you are thinking about, you know, some of our soldiers. I talked to a family a few weeks ago that said, we're, we're thinking about maybe going to Germany in our next assignment. And we've never been there. And how do you ship all the stuff and the dogs and the cats and the hamsters and the gerbils and the dishes? And I don't know. I, how do you get everything over there? And, the, and so guess who they're going to turn to? Now they're turning to people who have already been there and done that, right? And Amy and I, we, we were foster parents for many years. And uh, just had a great experience and a great ministry there. But, man, there's some difficult times. Amen, foster, you know that. Foster parents, adoptive parents, you know that. There's some difficult times. Who do you turn to? You turn to other foster parents. Because they know what you're going through, right? You, you get it. You understand this. And by the way, by the way, listen, that's why we do things the way we do them here at JC Naz. That's why our small group 
And discipleship is very intentional and it's very purposeful. Because you understand, we're trying to develop relationships here, right? We're not just interested in gathering a big old crowd in one room once a day a week, right? We're trying to build relationships so you can build connections and you can build, make memories together because there's, I tell you, there's no substitute for it, right? But let me tell you this. There is no greater affinity that any of us could ever experience than that with Jesus Christ. He's the ultimate one, who, the ultimate identifier with us when we're going through great, great difficulty and, and great trials and, 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 and all that. And, and In fact, he can relate to you so much right now, no matter what you're going through, perfectly, in fact. And I, I love here that in the midst of one of the most difficult and desperate times of David's life, he stops and he just considers Jesus. Again, in a way that I'm not even sure he understood the depth of that. That's a good model for us, amen? Hebrews 12, 3 says, consider Jesus. Who endured, it's not on the screen, just endured such hostility from sinners so that you will not grow weary and you'll not lose heart, right? Amen? That's a good prescription for your life. Consider Jesus. And I don't know how it is for you, but when I stop and do that, when I consider Jesus on the cross and I consider what God did for him to deliver him, it encourages me. It really encourages me in what I'm going through because, listen, as Jesus was dying on the cross, would you not all agree it looked pretty dark and pretty hopeless? Absolutely. Did, did, did it look, in that moment as he was strung up on a, on a cross, did it not look, now we know he wasn't, but did it not look like Jesus was wrong? Did it, you could say yes. A lot of people were doubting that at that moment. Was he, is it right? I mean, he said he was a Messiah, but he's on a tree and he's killed and... Did it not look like all God's plans and all God's purposes had come to a screeching halt? Amen? You bet it did. I'm telling you, not one person at the site of the crucifixion was expecting a resurrection. You read the Gospels. They were not anticipating. It's not like they were all standing there going, well, this is not real good, but hey, take heart. It's going to be Easter in three days. We're going to celebrate. No, it's not. No one was thinking that in the first century. It looked terribly hopeless and dark and desperate and it appeared hopeless but but listen God had a plan amen and not only did he have a plan but he had the power to pull that plan off and he did it and guess what I'm trying to say to you is again when when you consider Jesus in those moments when you feel crushed and you feel broken it 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 is so it really helps you it really encouraging because I'm telling you, when Jesus was suffering God stepped into the deepest darkest most awful part of that, and he rescued his son, amen? When everybody else thought it was impossible and hopeless, God did it. And again, it just reminds me in the midst of my situation, and when I'm brokenhearted, that he can and will do the same for me. And I want you to know this morning, if you put your faith in him and trust him at all times, he'll do it for you too. This is for everybody. I don't know, Pastor Mark. I mean, I want to believe that, but Man, if I could have five minutes with you and I could just explain to you my situation. It is so messed up. I'm telling you, my situation. We're always tempted to believe that we're the exception, right? And that's human nature. I'm not trying to bash you. I understand that. But my situation, Pastor Mark, is so out of control. Hey, let me just ask you. Did it not look out of control when Jesus was being whipped and scourged with a whip nearly to death? Did it not look out of control when he's being spit on in the face and beat on the head and slapped around and cursed and hung on a tree? Did it not look out, I mean, totally out of control? If you would have been there, you would have been looking at that and you would have been saying, man, God is so out of the picture right now. He's not even involved in this at all, but you couldn't have been more wrong. And the people who were thinking that could not have been more wrong. The Pharisees thought that they could not have been more wrong. Absolutely. God stepped in and he proved once and for all time that he was in control and that he had the power to keep his promise. I'm telling you, here it is, the rest of this verse. The Lord will rescue his servants. Isn't that awesome? Okay, talking about Jesus, now he moves to talking about us. Talking about the Lord and how he was rescued, but now talking to the Lord about all of us. It's just as, as, if, as if to say to us, just like God rescued and delivered his own son, guess what? He'll do that for you. It's right there. The Lord will rescue 
his servants. And by the way, let me say this. When we, when we tend to think, maybe you're feeling that way right now. If so, you're in a good place. We're so glad you've come. But when we say, my life's out of control, my circumstances are out of control, what we usually mean, if we're honest, is I'm not in control. To which I would reply, good. Because when we get our grubby little hands off the controls, guess what? Then God can finally do something, amen? amen? You may be out of control, but God is never out of control, amen? Ever! No matter what you're going through. I love, I love what Craig Grishel, Pastor Craig Grishel says. He says, God can do more through your surrender than you could ever do with your control. Man, I want to say that again. Someone needs to hear that. God can do more with your surrender than you could ever do in your control. And no, no, God doesn't always deliver or rescue the way we would imagine or the way we had thought or the way we expected or the way we prayed for. No, he doesn't. But thanks be to God. Listen, if God has not rescued you like you expected, here's the good news. He's just got something better planned for you. And I'm serious. We don't talk fluff here at JC Naz. This is, this is scripture truth right here. We're not trying to be cute and quick. You know what I'm saying? He's got something better for you in store for you. And if, and if God doesn't come through for you when you thought he should, listen, just know this. When God does deliver you, not if, when. When God does deliver, when he does save, when he does redeem, when he does rescue, just know that his timing is going to be incredible. And when it happens, and if you wait for it, and you don't bail out before you see it, that's, that's sometimes the struggle, isn't it? It's another sermon for another day. But if you wait for it and you persist and you put your faith and trust in him, listen, when you see it, you'll be praising him for his timing. You'll be praising him. You'll say, thank God it didn't come earlier because I would have been ready for it. And thank the Lord it didn't come later because I would have been driven to despair. Thank God that our God's always on time. Amen? So how do I experience this? How do I experience God's deliverance? Let's get super practical. I got to warn you, this is so, so complicated. I mean, I don't even know if I have enough time to explain this all to you. No, it's easy. Listen, it's easy. You want to know how you can experience God's deliverance? This is so easy. You're going to sit there and think, this cannot be all. This cannot work. It'll work, I promise you. Here it is. Cry out to the Lord. I wish I could make it more complicated. I wish I could sound more profound, but I'm just telling you what it is. It's, it's cry out to the Lord. Let me read the verse for you. 34, 17. The righteous those who know God are in right relationship with God because of Jesus' mercy. They cry out to the Lord, and the Lord hears them, and he delivers them out of all their troubles. No way. Yes way. It can't be that simple. It is that simple. Amen. It's so simple. I can't understand how crying out to God is going to change my situation. Well, listen, millions upon millions and millions of people have done that very thing over the centuries. Page after page after page in the Bible is filled with ordinary people, men and women, moms and dads, parents, grandparents, just like you, who cried out to God. And as they did that in faith, as they persisted in faith, listen, they experienced God does something so incredibly powerful. I just want to tell you this morning, God never speaks an empty word. He never speaks. He always has the power to back them up and perform what he says. So, so maybe you need to cry out to the Lord this morning. Maybe you're saying, I, I don't know how my situation could be changed. I don't know how it could, pieces could be picked up. Well, regardless, listen, I, I, can't, I can't explain to you this morning why some seem to cry out a single time and they experience God's powerful deliverance in the moment and some cry out for years. I can't, I can't explain that to you. I don't know. I've been on both sides of it myself. Sometimes it happens quick. Sometimes we... But the Lord is near regardless. Either way, either way. The truth of this promise is as real and relevant for you as if it was spoken, if it was spoken just today. It's as powerful as when it was first spoken. Psalm 50, verse 17 is what I'm referring to. Here it is right here. Why don't we all read it together? Psalm 50, verse 17. Here it is. Call on me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will honor me. Amen? You see the, you see the part there. Call on me. I will deliver you, and you'll honor me. Amen? Here's what I want to propose to you today, church. Let's not wait. Let's not wait. Let's not wait for the day of deliverance. Let's not wait for the rest of you to come before we give him the honor and the glory and the praise due to his name. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's praise him on the... Let's decide to do it today. Let's decide to do it now. Amen? Let's praise him. Let's honor him. 
And so, yeah, amen, praise God. And then listen, here it is. This is so cool. We're clear back to full circle, amen, from where we started. Don't worry, we're not starting the series over. But here we're back to the very first verse, right? I will bless the Lord at all times. Psalm 34, 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth, amen? Amen, stand with me. Praise team, come. We're going to worship him today. Amen. Don't wait. Don't wait for it to come. Don't wait for the answer to be revealed. Begin to praise him now, and you'll see the strong, mighty hand of God's deliverance. I promise you, you will. I don't know how. I don't know when. I don't know what shape it will come, but it will come. Amen? Let me pray for you as they're coming. We'll worship him. Father, thank you for speaking so powerfully through your word. Your word's amazing, so relevant and powerful to where we live every day, God. And we need that word of hope to carry with us into this week for the things we're facing and the decisions we have to make. And had someone in here today needed that word of hope. They needed to come in here and hear from you beyond all shadow of a doubt. And God, I pray, I praise you because you met us right where we live. You're so perfect in your love and your wisdom and all your ways. And so help us not to doubt, but to trust. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight, God. And us to choose to praise you for your deliverance, God, even before we see it. Father, we love you and we trust you in Jesus' name. Now, just if you just keep your head bowed for one more moment, for one more prayer. A lot of this message is really encouraging to anybody, a person of faith or not, but a lot of these messages are aimed at those who are already believers and who have already trusted Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and the gift of eternal life but some of you if you're honest you've not come to that point yet and again we are so glad that you're here this is a church for people who are checking the faith out and wondering if Jesus is all that he claims to be I promise you he is my life has been forever changed some of you need to cry out to the Lord today not just with help for a particular problem but with for deliverance for our biggest problem our sin problem there's a story in the Bible where Peter one of Jesus' followers was walking on the water and he cried out to God, it says. He cried out, and this is what he said, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Some of you have never come to that place, if you're honest, of saying, God, I need to be saved. I, I've sinned, God, and I know that there's something, you've not known what to call it, perhaps, but there's something separating you from God, but I'm telling you, that could be remedied today. That could be solved today. You could be born again the Bible says you can become a new creation in Christ by simply saying yes to God you say how do how would I do that well that's the wonderful part we like to help each other around here so in about 30 seconds I'm going to pray a prayer you could pray this with me from your own heart I can't save anybody my faith won't save you but your faith will save you the Bible says if you call upon the name of the Lord and you believe that he was crucified and risen for you to save you you will be saved isn't that good news to know that it will be well with your soul when you leave this earth. That soldier, that wonderful, that man that we passed on Sunday night, he was just doing what he did. Every, he did not know he was going to exit eternity that day. None of us have the assurance of another day. So my friend, if you're here today and you don't know for certain, absolute certain, that you know that you know that you know, you will go to heaven when you pass and you want to know that you're saved and Begin that relationship with God today. Why don't you just do that through this prayer? You can cry out, Lord, save me, and he'll hear and answer that prayer. So why don't we all bow together? And as you're bowing, all heads bowed, all eyes closed, I want you to ask you, if you want to, if you want to pray that prayer to God, I'm going to lead you in that prayer. If you want to pray that, raise your hand right now, wherever you're at. We're not going to embarrass you, I promise. We're not going to ask you to speak or move. There's a hand back there. If you'll just kindly hold that up until somebody with a blue bag finds you. They're going to stand beside you. They're going to pray with you. There's some resources in that bag that's going to help you continue on. If you choose to continue to follow Jesus, there's going to be some resources in that bag to help you build a strong, lasting relationship with the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Anybody else? You say, I want to know the Lord today. I want my sins forgiven. Anybody else? We've got a few there. Praise God. All right. If you lifted your hand and say, I want to begin a relationship with the Lord today. I want to be saved. You Pray this with me, okay, in faith. We're all going to to pray together. Father in heaven, I turn to you now and I confess all of my sins. I admit that I've grieved your spirit. I've tried to control my own life. 
but today I turn to you as Lord. I surrender and I ask your forgiveness. Cleanse me of all my sin and come into my life and give me the power and give me the desire to follow you all the days of my life and to serve you and to love you and to know you better. Help me to lead others to a knowledge of the Savior. God, I am yours and you are mine. In Jesus' name, amen. If you heard that prayer, amen. If you heard that, if you prayed that prayer, God heard you. And today's a, an amazing day in your life. The Bible says that all the angels of heaven are celebrating when one who is lost has been found. One who is dead is now alive in Christ. Amen. We celebrate with you as well. Let's praise the Lord. We'll be dismissed. Let's sing how good God is. Amen.